Acts chapter 27 in your Bibles. It'll be the last time I say this because we'll finish chapter 27 today. Woo woo. <laughs> Acts chapter 27, beginning at verse 42. We'll work our way to through chapter 28, verses 10 this morning. Quickly, very quickly, we will be uh, finishing the book of Acts. We began chapter 27 on the 25th of October. See, it hasn't been that long. 25th of October, we began chapter 27. I mean, there are 44 verses in chapter 27. There's a lot of good stuff here, so let's not rush through the Word of God so quickly, huh? General Sherman started his devastating march to, uh, to the sea on 16 November 1864. Sherman became famous for the brutal march across Georgia and another through the Carolinas in 1865. Sherman's troops destroyed much of the South's military and economic resources. He captured Atlanta, burning most of Atlanta. He then began his march to the sea. His troops, they would strip the farms and the fields and the houses, uh, not intending to leave any kind of resources that the enemy could use against them. And he hoped that the terrible destruction would break the South's will to continue fighting. The march ended at Savannah, Georgia, near the ocean, having caused untold agony and suffering. And Satan, as well, did all that he could to discourage Paul from continuing on his mission. He threw everything he could at the Apostle Paul. One devastation after another hit the determined Apostle. And no sooner had he been saved from shipwreck than he found a snake latched onto his hand on the island of Malta. What kind of snake it was is not known, though it was poisonous because the islanders expected that Paul would die within minutes. When he did not die, they concluded that he was some sort of superhuman, perhaps a god. And Paul, always spiritually aware, used the occasion to tell them likely to tell them about the salvation in Jesus Christ, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. God always keeps His promises. He always keeps His promises. You, you need to get that and burn that into your soul. He always keeps His promises, no matter how dark things appear in the world, no matter what is going on in your life, God always keeps His word. He is a God of integrity. He's a God that makes a promise, and He will not pull back or renege on his promise. And he had promised that no lives would be lost in the shipwreck. However, the attack of Satan was not over quite yet. We must remember that just as one battle is won, it doesn't mean that the war is over. And our battle against Satan and against evil will continue until we go home or Jesus returns for his church. And Paul was confident, and we should be as well, John, the Apostle John reminds us, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God turns attacks into opportunity for sharing the good news. He did it for Paul, and he does it for you and I today. He is the same God. We read back in verse 27 of chapter 27 that 14 days since the storm first struck, when the 14th night had come. The ship was being driven about in the Adriatic Sea. That's about 324 hours on a fierce, stormy sea. Harrowing as it was, God was in control. He always is. He caused the ship to drift over 400 miles from the speck of an island called Clauda, to another speck in the Mediterranean called Malta. They worked for at least 14 days, and they worked hard for at least 14 days to stay alive. God's promise and care is not opposed to using prudence and common sense. Just because Paul had the word and Paul shared the word with everybody, that doesn't mean that everybody sat in the lower deck just waiting to, for this to be over, just to ride it out. They still had to work. So God's promises and His care 
is not opposed to using prudence and common sense and even in our lives today. We have the promise that nothing will take us out of God's hands, but that doesn't mean that we set back and do nothing. We have the good word of God that we should go and share the gospel. We are to be kind to one another. The 31 or 32 one another's are clearly in Scripture, but we are not to set back and wait for God to move us, to make us feel like we want to do something. We do it whether we feel like it or not, because it's the right thing to do. Trusting God in storms gives the world a view of God's leadership and care. And certainly, the Apostle Paul did that during this storm. Paul trusted in God, and everyone could see it. And his example had a calming effect on all of them, as we see in verse 36. The truth was, his confidence in their survival and his example encouraged others to eat food, participate in that blessing that they to this point had not done and likely is because they were seasick being tossed about his faith continued to be the source of their courage he's the one that kept them from jumping overboard as early as they did trying to get away in the the small boat the dinghy the text says when the day came And this is very close to, this is verse 39. When the day came, none of the soldiers, or excuse me, none of the sailors recognized the coastline. Malta's harbor was on the other side of the island, which is why they didn't recognize it. All they can discern was a bay and a beach. So the sailors cut the four stem, or excuse me, stern anchors free in the back, leaving them at sea. And the rudders were untied, and they let those rudders, there were two rudders that they would tie up to guide the ship. They cut them, and they let them back down to guide them. Remember, the front of the boat is facing towards the beach. Because when they cut the stern anchors, it will, they want to beach the craft is what they want to do. They want to get close enough to where they have a chance of surviving. They can jump out and swim to shore. You don't want to swim two miles to get to shore. You want to get as close as you can. So they cut the anchors. They untied and let the rudders back down into the water. They hoisted the foresail to guide the ship, and they struck a reef where two seas met, the text says, and they ran the vessel aground. The front of the ship, the bow stuck, but the ship did not break up, and that's very unusual for a wooden ship to embed itself in a sandbar and not break apart. It must run into a... a, thick mud that will slow it down or sand that will slow it down and then lodge itself in some sort of thick mud or clay with the composition strong enough to hold it in place and that actually happened according to Luke it actually happened in verse 41 where it says the reef where two seas met the word reef there is interpreted um, by the translator Uh, Remember back in verse 17, there was the word sea anchor, and some of your translations, it may say mainsail, they threw over the mainsail. The word literally is gear. So if you have a a NIV, you're reading, they were stuck in the sandbar. And the King James Version has falling into a place where two seas met. What had happened here is they encountered a patch of cross currents and they ran the ship of ground. And where these cross currents came across, there was a lot of sand and a lot of clay that was built up. And God directed the ship, the bow of the ship, to embed itself right there. When that happened, the back of the boat became subject to the waves. When that happened, the storm didn't go away. It continued to pound the ship. And so now what you have is the ship is stuck and the waves are pounding it. When it's out on the open shore, out in the open sea, the, the, the ship gives way. So the waves don't hit it quite as hard. But now the front of it is stuck. It's not going anywhere. It's like the wall, it's like the waves hitting a solid wall. There's no give 
And so the ship is not going to last long with the waves pounding the back of it like this. The convergence of the two seas resulted in an accumulation, as we noted, of sand and clay and mud. Very unusual combination. It probably ran into the thick sand that slowed it down a little bit, and then it hit the mud and the clay, and it was firm enough to hold the ship there. And writers tell us that St. Paul's Bay has clay that is capable of doing that. The prow is stuck, the stern, the back of the ship endured the full force of the sea. It must have been a short time, not a long time, before it was obvious that the ship would not survive. There was no alternative at this point but to abandon ship. You look what it says in verse 41. Striking a reef or a sandbar... Where two seas met, they ran the vessel aground. The prow stuck fast and remained immovable. The stern began to be broken up by the force of the waves. So here we go. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, kept them from their intention and commanded that those who could swim jump overboard first, get to land. The rest should follow, some on planks and others on various things from the ship. And so it happened that they were all brought safely to land. And when they had been brought safely through, then they found out the island was called Malta. The natives showed us extraordinary kindness, for because of the rain that had set in and because of the cold, they kindled a fire and received us all. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began saying to one another, Undoubtedly this man is a murderer. And though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. However, he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. But they were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to leading men of the island, to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us courteously three days. And it happened that the father of Publius was laying in bed, infected with a recurring fever and dysentery. And Paul went in to see him, and after he had prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. After this had happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and getting cured. They also honored us with many marks of respect. And when we were setting sail, they supplied us with all we needed. At the end of the three months, verse 11 tells us they were there on the island three months. All of this happened. First, we encounter that the prisoners and the passengers are spared from death in verses 42 through 44. It was obvious that it was going to be every man for himself. Naturally, the soldiers, put yourself in a soldier's sandals, they knew full well that They dare not let their prisoners escape. If they did let their prisoners escape, if they did escape, the soldiers would pay with their own lives. That was the Roman law. You lose a soldier, you lose a prisoner, you lose your life. And it's quite possible that some of these prisoners were under sentence of death, and if so, they would likely attempt to escape. It'd be natural to try to get to escape knowing where they're going. Well, not knowing where they were, the soldiers did not want to take the risk, and so they determined to kill all the prisoners on the ship and then attempt to make it to land. Now, Julius, the centurion, was responsible for Paul, and he had come to a point where he trusted Paul. Paul had proved himself trustworthy, repeatedly so. And because of this, Julius issued the orders to the soldiers not to kill the prisoners, And again, it was Paul's presence that was responsible for the preservation of the people on the ship. Well, 
the rowboat, the dinghy, was gone. They could not escape that way, thanks to the conniving by some of the crew. Remember earlier, they, they faked, the word fake is popular these days, they faked going back to the back of the ship and throw an anchor, and they were really going to drop the boat. Paul knew about it somehow. He told the centurion. The centurion went back there and cut the boat away. So your life raft, okay, life raft, help, life raft, they just kind of watch disappear in the darkness. That's the, that's the measure of the centurion's trust of Paul. The only way to reach the shore is to swim or grab a floating piece of the boat. Those who could swim were ordered to jump first, according to the second part of verse 43. The non-swimming types held on to floating debris for dear life, and everyone made it safely to the shore. The order of the abandonment was crew, then the passengers, and then the prisoners jumped overboard. And this, this event, this real event, is opposite of many shipwreck stories that you and I perhaps are familiar with. For example, Jonah. Jonah, who endangered the lives of everyone on board because he too was on board. The way to save the sailors in that case was to throw Jonah overboard, which they did. And the, the storm immediately stopped. Well, in this story, which is real, it's not fictitious... Paul's presence was not the reason for the storm. Furthermore, his presence was the reason everyone survived. They needed to stay on the ship in order to survive. You see, the Lord was with Paul. He was working through Paul and to bring everyone to safety. An old commentator, Matthew Henry, older commentator, Jonathan Edwards used Matthew Henry. Even stormy winds fulfill God's counsel. They do. If we have but the eyes to see it, every stormy wind fulfills God's counsel. Paul was a leader because he knew his God and where his God was taking him. He was confident of that. Those kinds of leaders encourage those around them. You look back at verse 22 and verse 25 and verse 34. You see this kind of leadership. They know their God. They know where they're going. And trusting God is not hard to see in really stormy times. In fact, that's when they shine the brightest. You will see calmness. What sort of things would would you see? You will see calmness. You will see confidence. You will see an example that will reassure others. Storms can give us the opportunities to serve others and to show Jesus Christ to those who are watching, a world that is watching the church of Jesus Christ in this COVID kind of times in which we live. How is the church of Jesus Christ behaving itself? Does it see itself as a non-essential? Or does it understand truly what Scripture says about itself? The world is watching. The Lord has turned the spotlight to us. On this ship, Paul was the most valuable man. And did you know this is Paul's fourth shipwreck? Not his first. Not his first rodeo, folks. According to 2 Corinthians 11.25, there were three shipwrecks that he had survived earlier. This is his fourth You see, Paul had learned to trust God. He had learned to trust God. Older commentator Vance Vance Havner said, "Our Our Lord's life was full of storm and tempest, yet in the darkest days of all, He bestowed to us His legacy of peace. His rest is no imaginary escape from reality. The computer games do not offer a real escape. There is no escape in computer games or whatever you do to try to escape. There is no rest in anything but Jesus Christ. He offers the rest. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's not talking about you need some sleep. He's talking about the unrest in your soul. You know in your soul 
that you are not at peace with your creator. And Jesus invites people to come to him and you will, I will give you that rest in your soul. And you will be able to know that you are in my hands and that I have you and nothing can take you away. You will have peace then and only then. Now, what's going on now? Now all are safely washed up on shore. They're safe yet soaked. They're alive yet exhausted. We look at Paul's ministry on the island. We begin to see that. However, first, note the initial words in chapter 28, verse 1. When they have been brought safely through. That's a passive voice. You see that. When they have been brought safely through. Passive voice. What that means is the crew did not get themselves through this. It wasn't their nautical skills. It wasn't their enduring strength. When the text says they have been brought through safely... Passive voice means God brought them through safely. God did this. God brought them through. It's important that we not become disoriented and we lose our way, thinking that, okay, Lord, take a break. This is an easy one. I got this. No biggie. And then when something happens, we say, my bad, my bad. Okay. It's important that we not become disoriented and lose our way. Our ability to attain graduation certificates, our ability to master skills is all from God. God gave us the ability. And if he wanted to take the ability away, he could take the ability away. Just as easily as he granted it to us. And to be unthankful with no gratitude, knowing this truth, is the peak of pride. So we come to chapter 28, verses 1 and 2, and we see hospitality. Hospitality is this extraordinary display of common grace. So far as we know, none of the people became believers on Malta. We'll discuss that a little bit, a little bit later. But here you have extraordinary display of common grace. You see that in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 28, and you see it in verse 10 as well. Well, when they finally pulled themselves onto the beach, they discovered that the island is Malta, Melite. It's how it is in the Greek, Melite. It's Malta. It's about 58 miles south of Sicily and 180 miles northeast of Africa. Because of its many harbors, this island was a base for east-west commerce in the Mediterranean Sea. And it was frequently used by ancient ships as a place to spend the winter. Remember from probably October through February or so, where it was a very dangerous time to be out on the open sea. So Malta provided safety for the winter months, the three winter months. Verse 11, as we noted earlier, they remained here for three months. That's the three months of winter. The Phoenicians had settled this island, and they named it Malta, meaning a place of refuge. And the people, where, the people there that we see there when Paul swam to shore were of Phoenician descent. And through the years, through the hundreds of years, of course, the rule on the island changed a few times most recently, the Romans took the island from the Carthaginians in 218 B.C. So the Romans have had it for a couple of hundred years now. Almost a couple of hundred years. Luke describes them as natives, or literally the word is barbarian. He describes them as barbarians, the natives. The barbarians showed extraordinary kindness. The word barbarian there doesn't mean savages. It doesn't mean uncivilized. It means that they are ignorant of Greek and Latin. That was the thought in the day. If you did not know Greek and Latin, you were regarded as a barbarian. That's why literally the word is barbaroi, barbarian. 
It was not a derogatory term. Think of that term barbarian here in this context as equivalent to foreigners. And then you'll have a pretty good idea. These foreigners, they didn't know Greek or Latin, showed us extraordinary kindness, unexpected kindness. It's unusual kindness that they received. And kindness, we've come across this before, is our English word philanthropy. They gave of themselves. It was unusual. It was unexpected. It was out of the ordinary. It's not what you would think someone would do in a day. It exceeds what one might normally expect of a stranger. Remember, these, these people of Malta do not know who just swam ashore. They have no idea who they are. And yet, God's common grace is evident in them, and they showed extraordinary kindness to them. We have to understand as well that the area was also full of pirates at this time, and so the kind treatment is further evidence of God's divine protection. God is providing everything necessary for these men, and in particularly for the Apostle Paul, so that he might arrive in Rome. There are many people in Rome, evidently, who need to hear the gospel, and the church at Rome needs to be encouraged. The kindness is also a demonstration of Romans 2. We've noted that it's a common grace. That comes, and we read about that in Romans chapter 2. That's where this kindness comes from. It's God's revelation to all people. It's what we call general revelation. The moral law written on the hearts. In Romans 2, Paul writes, When Gentiles who do not have the law of Moses do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law, are law unto themselves in that they show the work of the law written on their hearts. It's there. It's in creation, and it's woven into the fabric of everybody who's created in his likeness and image. Conscience bears witness to that. It's not the conscience. The conscience bears witness to that. But this here you have strong evidence, a strong expression of this law that of these gentiles who are a law unto themselves that that the law that was written on their hearts is very strong in them for some reason god call god has caused it to be very strong in them and therefore they show an unexpected unusual sort of kindness to them and the verse says because for because of the rain that had set in and because of the cold they kindled a fire and received us all. You know, they could, have, they could have looked out their window and said, Holy cow, look out there, look at that rain. Martha, I think I see people swimming up on the beach. Wow, they must be cold, Just drinking their hot coffee. They didn't do that. They went outside into the driving rain, into the cold, and they showed unusual kindness to these people. The rain, literally the rain that stood upon them, which would describe a, a downpour. This is what happened at this time. They were shipwrecked, but they received unexpected treatment. Now, what was it? What was the treatment? It says that they kindled a fire and received us all. And it's not clear whether they, this is one fire that warms all 276, which is a little, a little difficult to swallow there. Or that they were many small fires that they started, and Luke simply focuses on that one fire that Paul was at. It's more than likely that it's a smaller fire that Luke Zero is in on. They must have had wood somewhere that remained dry. Perhaps they brought him under some rocks or something where they were out of the rain, and they did this for them. They kindled a fire and received us all. And there's no reason to think that us all means the three Christians. Aristarchus, Luke, and Paul. There's no reason to restrict the all to just those three. And then we come to verses 3 through 6. We go from extreme and unusual hospitality to a scene where you have God versus God. Big G God versus little g God. The religious thoughts of the natives are exposed here, and it's quite interesting. But try to put yourself 
in their shoes. Try to imagine this. The air temperature at this time of the year is in the mid-60s. The water temperature is somewhere between 70 and 73 degrees, which doesn't sound too bad until you step into 70-degree water and realize that's a bit chilly. Well, the water temperature would be considered slightly warm. Remember, the sailors have been fighting to keep the ship floating for at least 14 days. The wind has not let up. The men are wet. 72-degree water is okay. By the way, 79-degree water is considered warm. So 72-degree water is okay, but when you're wet, you've been fighting the storm for 14 days, exposed to the wind, a fire is really appealing about now. Really appealing. They are finally on land. What a relief. They were, the sailors and the soldiers, of course, were seriously doubting that they would be saved out of this storm. God, however, was right. Through his servant, Paul, all 276 men are warming themselves by a fire. Paul was, was doing his part. He was gathering some wood. The Apostle Paul gathering wood. Is there a service here at Christ Bible that you consider below you too menial for you? When the Apostle Paul was gathering wood. Is there something that you think that's too menial for you to roll up your sleeves and jump in? If so, consider Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Paul is doing his part. He's going about picking up sticks. It says that he picked up a bundle. Verse 3. Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks. The word bundle. The word bundle there, of course, is not a couple of sticks. It means a whole bunch. He gathered a great number, uh, probably reaching down and grabbed three or four or five or something at a time. And clearly, he did not see a viper hidden in the sticks. And what does the snake do? The snake either leaps out of the fire as he tosses it in, as he bends down to toss it in, The snake either leaps out of the fire because of the heat and bites and latches on Paul's hand. Or as Paul approaches the fire, he bites Paul's hand. One of the two, it's difficult to tell which is which. Nevertheless, Luke tells us that the viper fastened itself on his hand. In verse 3, the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand in verse 4. You know, as you do this, I guess. The snake did not let go. He was hanging down from Paul's hand. And can you imagine the look on people's faces? Can you imagine your own self out doing a fire out back or something like that, and you look up and you... You see this thing hanging off your hand or off your brother's hand or your mom or your dad's hand or something like that. First of all, you'd be deer in headlights initially. And if you had it hanging on your hand, you probably would go into a panic. (laughs) You probably would start flinging that hand and maybe throw your shoulder out of joint. Paul didn't do that. You imagine the look on these people's faces. A snake latched onto a hand, hanging there. You know, now, critics have chirped. That's what they do. They chirp. Critics do. They don't reason or suggest. They chirp. Critics have chirped that this is a fictional story told by Luke to glorify Paul or that Luke mistook, mistook the harmless snake for a poisonous one. Well, the text says viper. There's no reason to think viper is a misprint. Paul, uh, Luke is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't make mistakes. And we also see proof that this was a poisonous snake, snake, and it comes from the reaction of the islanders. The people who saw this fully expected Paul to die 
after he was bitten. And you think about what Paul did not do here. He did not, in a panic, fling the creature onto someone else. Which is what we might have accidentally done. Because as you're running away and backing up, the other one is slinging this thing, and who knows, it might have hit someone else. He was calm. Number two, Paul did not do anything spiritual like kneel down to pray or say some pious last words, preach or call for a prayer meeting. He appeared to have simply gone on, gone about doing what he was doing. Maybe he went back and picked up more sticks. Didn't think anything about it. You know, everyone is a theologian. We've, we've mentioned this before in the past years. Everyone is a theologian. Everyone has a grid by which they evaluate life. Events, catastrophes, decisions, death. We all have a filter. It's been put together by how we were raised and what we think, what we read, our own sense of fairness. That's the file. That's the filter that you and I have. We, everyone has one. Everybody is a theologian. The, theologian means the study of God, whether it's little g or big G. And we know this because of Romans 1. Everyone knows God's exist, God exists, and you cannot trick Him or escape His presence. It's impossible. The natives or the barbarians demonstrate that truth. The only one question remains for the barbarians and for us barbarians, because we don't know Greek or Latin either. One question remains outstanding. Are you a good theologian? Is your theology, your study of God, accurate with Scripture, with the truth? What were the thoughts of the barbarians? They are theologians, you know. No, I haven't been to seminary. It's not what we're talking about. You have a way of thinking about and evaluating events around you. You either, get, you either credit the virus with... Fate, chance, goofy scientists in China, or a God who doesn't care. But you have some sort of explanation. And these natives are theologians as well. Their judgment, their view on what they saw was that Paul was a murderer. That's their quick evaluation. The natives had an animistic worldview. They thought of the gods as using the forces of nature, especially storms and sea, for retributive justice. So when that snake latched onto Paul's hand, what they saw was, in their mind, a sure sign that Paul was a fugitive from the gods and divine retribution had caught up with him. That was their thinking. That's their worldview. Worldviews are important. It needs to be biblical so that you accurately understand the things taking on around, going on around you. See, they have a theology. A person who commits such acts, presuming he was a murderer, receives such retribution. So you see, they do have a theology. Think about this. Who determined that murder is wrong? Where did you get that idea that murder is wrong? From Scripture. No, I got it from the Greek gods. No, 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 no. God was before the Greek gods. The Greek gods borrowed it from God. Well, the Egyptians, they were first. No, no. God was before the Egyptians. The Egyptians borrowed it from God. Everything comes from God because He is God. He's first. There was nobody before Him. There are lots of codes, ancient codes, that reflect principles of Scripture. There's a strong common grace in these people. That's where it comes from. They're not competing gods out there. It's the most ridiculous notion that man could hatch. What in their souls, think of this, what in their souls believes there is retribution or believes there is judgment? Who told them this? 
Where did they learn this from? You see the word undoubtedly in your text. Undoubtedly means, of course, this man has taken someone's life. And they're not debating, debating among themselves whether, whether he has done this. They are saying certainly or undoubtedly, of course, this man has taken someone's life. Why would a snake bite him like that? So they're not de- debating. They are speaking to each, each other over and over again. But their judgment is in every respect certain. They are sure, so sure of themselves that Paul is getting what he justly deserves. Acts chapter 21 and verse 22 uses that word certainly. It's the same word that's translated certainly. You know what the text says, justice. Verse 6, they were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall down dead, but after they waited a long time, they saw that nothing happened. They expected justice to have an effect, to take, to do something. Now, justice here is a noun. Justice is personified as a goddess in their, their religious thinking. There is this goddess named Justice. And though Paul escaped the shipwreck and the storm, Justice found him. She found him. This goddess. This goddess has not allowed him to, lo- to live. Justice has not allowed him life. That's their thinking. That's their worldview. This word justice is the word, it's spelled D-I-K-E, D-K. And in their system, it's the name of a Greek goddess, Justice, who was responsible for meeting out to the guilty their just rewards, their just desserts. So this man, Paul, lived through a shipwreck only to be met by justice, which is a reference to a directing fate. His death is regarded as fixed by divine decree is what, is what these people thought. So here, bad theology gets trumped by good theology. Justice was not catching up with Paul. Quite the contrary. Providence was preserving him. The snake, the creature was shook off, it fell into the fire, and Paul suffered no harm. And I would, I would encourage you to follow Paul's example anytime you have a snake. Just a little personal bias there. Paul shook the snake off into the fire. He himself, verse 5, suffered no harm. Luke gives us no hint, much less an explicit statement, that Paul was bothered or concerned about the poison at all. The reason for his calm demeanor, God had assured him that he will reach Rome. He was confident that God was going to fulfill what he said. Now take note, take note, Paul did not try to find the snake. This was, this, he, this was not a show of his faith. Snake handlers sometimes use this passage to justify their dangerous practices. But Paul was not looking for poisonous snakes to show his faith here. Paul had a promise from God and he would promise from God that he would reach Rome. This is not a snake handling passage by any means. Neither is Mark 16. In fact, Mark 16 is probably that part of Mark 16 is not part of the original text. Well, when that happened, the The natives, the barbarians expected Paul to swell up and die or merely to simply drop dead, it says in in verse 6. They kept watching for a sequence of events that never happened. And after a long time, neither of the expectations came to fruition. So they changed their minds. How about that? That theology just turned the page. It's in flux. This this was the uh, precursors for open theism where God discovers and then he changes his plan somehow. 
They changed their mind. They drew the opposite conclusion from all of this. The word unusual means surprising or out of place. And here it would be misfortune. It would be understood as misfortune. They watched, expected, but no misfortune comes. You see the certainty of which they believed Paul to be guilty when the expected fate did not happen, then in their thinking, obviously Paul was not a man. Couldn't be. You can't survive this. So you're not a man. You must be God, a God. You know, this kind of thinking is is fairly prevalent in Christianity today among people. This guilty is proof of guilt or excuse me, calamity is proof of guilt kind of attitude lives with us today. It's a thought pattern as old as time itself. The classic case is in the scripture, in the scriptures is Job. Job was an upright man who worked hard. He dealt honestly with people and he walked with God. Then seemingly out of nowhere, a whirlwind of tragedies drove the man to his knees. And this calamity is proof of guilt kind of attitude lives with us today. It's bad enough that he lost his livestock, all of his means, all the means of income. On top of that, he lost each one of his children. And finally, he lost his health. And with hardly a moment between these calamities to catch his breath, Job was reduced to a painful shell covered from head to toe with oozing skin ulcers. Here comes the cavalry. Enter the thoughtless counselors. One man after another pointed their long, stubby, or bony finger at them, frowning at him and condemning words, giving him condemning words and advising him to confess his guilt because, after all, the calamity as proof of guilt is clear here. And it's still with us today. In effect, each one of those Faultless counselor said, you're getting what you deserve. The confrontational dialogue contained in the book of Job is remarkably relevant, is it not? And do you note, did you note how quickly Luke dropped the scene to move on to another? At the end of verse 6, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. Boom, that's it. Luke gave us the details when the natives of Lystra saluted Paul and Barnabas as gods. Paul quickly set them straight back in chapter 14, verses 11 through 15. And when Cornelius wanted to bow down, in fact, he did bow down. Peter told him to stand up. Cornelius wanted to worship Peter. He corrected him immediately back in chapter 10, verse 25 and following. So... Why no correction here? Has God's theology changed? No, not at all. Are we? What's, why no correction here? The answer, I believe, is that there had already been two corrections. Is there a need for another one? God did not believe it was necessary. So are we... Think about this. Are we, readers, left with the impression that Paul is a God? Did it enter into your mind after reading verse 6, indeed, Paul is a God? No, it didn't enter your mind. Not at all. Clearly not. We, the readers, are left with the thought that God was protecting Paul. God's providence preserved him. And everyone through the storm at sea and on land. Both were miraculous. That's the impression that we are left with. So it's very likely that Luke did not regard it necessary to answer this again. He had answered it twice earlier. And directed by the Holy Spirit, obviously we did not need another answer. Both of these were miraculous. God saving them, bringing them to the shore, all safe. 
He was protecting Paul and preserving him. Those were both miraculous. And speaking of the miraculous, we made the observation at the beginning of chapter 27. We, we called it the features of chapters 27 and 28, that the gospel is not preached you notice through here that there is no gospel presentation. You're not going to find one. It's not there. That is odd to us as readers because the platforms that God built for Paul are as plain as the nose on his face. It's as if God sets the table, as it were, but then there's no word from Luke of what Paul did. Also, it is odd to us because usually miracles are a prelude to the preaching of the gospel. They have been a prelude to the preaching of the gospel in chapter 3, chapter 14, and chapter 19. Why not here? I mean, you have a captive audience, right? 273 men on a ship. What more could you ask for? They're not going anywhere. Now they're on the beach, all huddled around the fire. It's odd to us. Miracles provide the occasion and opportunity for sharing the gospel. So I have a question for you. Since the text doesn't say, let me ask you this. Is it appropriate to say Luke gave us no account of Paul's evangelizing Malta? Or is it more appropriate to say Paul did not preach the gospel while on Malta because Luke did not say that he did. Two different answers, two different questions there. Do you see the difference between them? Is it more appropriate to say Luke gave no account of Paul's evangelizing Malta? Or is it more appropriate to say Paul did not preach the gospel while on Malta because Luke did not say that he did? I believe the proper answer is the former, not the latter. Luke gave no account of Paul's evangelizing Malta. On what grounds? Since, Paul, since Luke did not write this, on what grounds do you, do you say this? Are you saying something that Scripture is not saying? No. On what grounds? The pattern of miracle and witness found throughout Acts. Acts 3, Acts 19, with those passages that we just noted. Acts 14 as well. The grounds is that pattern of miracle and witness that's found throughout Acts. It is not a hill to die on, of course. You may conclude, I'm not sure that Paul, that Paul preached the gospel. Okay. But it's not a hill to die on. But there is more foundation to think that Paul did preach the gospel to the, Mal to the Maltese than that he did not, based on what? The pattern that you have in Acts. And speaking of miraculous, verses 7 through 10. The extraordinary display of God's power in verses 7 through 10. Something else took place during the crew's three-month stay on the island. They were three days spent, they spent three days in the home of Publius. Who in the world was Publius? He was the leading man of the island. He might have been the governor of the island. Some people make the, the argument, make, try to make the case that he was the governor. The leading man is the governor on the island, and that's very possible. We do have ancient inscriptions that show that the head official on Malta had the title of first man on the island. And you know that us is used twice in verse 7. In the neighborhood of that place where lands becoming to the leading man on the island named Publius who welcomed us and entertained us. Luke does not identify the us. Still, we have little, if any, reason to think that Publius singled out the three believers for special treatment. Most likely this man, this governor, graciously welcomed all 276 people and entertained them courteously for three days until they could make arrangements for winter quarters. The extraordinary hospitality. 
during the three days stay there, Paul became aware of Publius' father who was ill with fever and dysentery. Those are very specific terms, fever and dysentery. What was the illness? If you're curious about anything, you always ask the questions of the text. What was the illness? Quite possibly, it was a sort of gastric fever caused by a, a microbe in goat's milk. It's fairly well known on Malta. And it was at one time so common that the illness was called Malta fever. The duration, it is said, could last for months and even up to three years. And, reportedly, there was a vaccine that was developed for it in 1887. But Paul did something unique here. The text says that he prayed, then laid his hands on him, in verse 8. Peter, John, and Philip, and Paul are the ones who do the healing in the book of Acts. And we know that laying hands on the person that he healed was done by Jesus a few times, in Matthew 9, in Mark 5, in Mark chapter 6. But surprisingly, this is the only time in the book of Acts where both prayer and the laying on of hands accompany the healing. So I, I would ask my charismatic brothers and sisters, why is such an emphasis on praying and laying on of hands? It only happened once in the book of Acts. For them, Acts is a Bible within a Bible. Because for our charismatic brothers and sisters, if it happens in the book of Acts, it should be happening today. Everything in Acts is normative and should be taking place now. You would think that it would be all over the book of Acts, but it's not. This is the only time. And the word translated healed in the Greek there usually refers to instantaneous healing, an on-the-spot miracle is what took place here with Publius, his father. Of course, Paul was not the source of this power. He was only the vehicle. God was working through him. He was the human instrument through whom God supernaturally worked. We have no reason to think that Paul stole the glory from his father in this. He communicated this. It's very reasonable to believe that Paul communicated this to Publius. If Publius, remember, they already looked at him as a god. I have to believe, based on examples before in the book of Acts, that Paul set them straight. And you know what happens when miraculous thing takes place. What happens? People come from far and wide. People come from far and wide. And when a miraculous thing is done, people come... And they wish to be healed as well. And that's precisely what took place here. The news got out. The father of the leading man of the island had been cured of the fever, had been healed of the fever and dysentery. So naturally, many people found hope in what the survivor of the shipwreck could do for them. Verse 9, you see two verbs. Were coming and getting cured. Both of those verbs tell us that over the course of their time there, not just the three days, but their three months there, that multiple healings, or multiple cures were, were, were made. That took place. Now there was a difference, however. This is interesting. There was a difference. You note that the translation is, in verse 9, getting cured. You see this in verse 9 coming to him and getting cured. Why didn't, he, why didn't the translators translate that, coming to him and being healed? Because that's a different word. Getting cured is a different word than healed up in verses, verse 8. The word getting cured is our word therapy. Hmm. It might be translated, were treated. So verse 9, after this had happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and were getting treated or getting cured is okay, but not healed. 
It's a different word. It suggests, the word suggests that it, wasn't, it was not miraculous healings, but medical treatment. You know what Luke is. According to Colossians, he is a physician. And it's very likely here that Luke joined Paul and treated many people. Therapy. Therapuo is the word. So verse 10 and verse 11 suggest that this thing that took place, this medical ministry lasted throughout the three months stay at Malta. In other words, most of the ill went through a process, a prolonged period of recovery, which perhaps lasted for three months, and maybe the recovery continued after they left. And if Luke were involved in this with Paul, it would be one of the earliest references in all of Scripture to an overseas medical missionary work. They were getting cured. It doesn't necessarily mean or imply, or is it a passage? It's not necessarily a passage that you could use saying the, the gifts of healing phased out in time. See, Paul did not even heal. Well, just days before he did heal. So whatever reason in God's plan and purpose, there was a lot of therapy taking place, a lot of medicinal kind of things that were going on. And people were getting cured. God was blessing that process. And finally, we come to verse 10. The emphasis on hospitality here is striking. It is repeated throughout the account of Paul's stay on Malta. The people welcomed the shipwreck party with unusual kindness, verse 2, Publius received the whole group and entertained them hospitably, in verse 7. And on their departure, the travelers were honored and amply fitted for their journey, verse 10. Paul was never treated this way in Jerusalem. All they tried to do in Jerusalem was kill him. Damascus, they tried to kill him. Jerusalem, they tried to kill him. And he's not going to receive this kind of hospitality in Rome either. Luke does not specify the nature of the honors. You see verse 10. Many marks of respect. They supplied us with all we needed. Luke doesn't specify what they were specifically, but the second part of the verse there suggests that the Honors consisted of provisions, probably beyond what would normally be expected. That would be consistent with the passage. The natives gave to them uh, all that they needed and more when they set sail at the end of winter. Did you know there is a tradition? Of course, it's only tradition. The tradition says that the church on Malta dates from this time, and Publius was the first pastor. I wouldn't put it past God to say Publius and a lot of people. The hospitality, as we noted, here on Malta from these Gentiles who had no law, who knew nothing about the true God other than something out there exists and they conjured up some sort of fantasies in their mind and they gave it structure and then they try to obey it. The hospitality was overwhelming there, but it will not be the same in Rome. The Jews of Rome will not be so hospitable. God was extremely gracious in providing all that was necessary and protecting them through all of this mess. And He's the same God today on His throne. He's not different. He doesn't always work the same way, but He's still the same powerful, sovereign God who works His good providence and his people. And he taps unbelievers ever so often to provide for his people. That's just what God does. In fact, it was one of the puzzles that Solomon wrestled with. In the book of Ecclesiastes, just one passage to read to you. Solomon, apart from Christ, the wisest man on the earth, 
In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Listen what it says here. Verse 26 of chapter 2. For to a person who is good in his sight, he has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, while to the sinner he has given the task of gathering and collecting so that he may give to the one who is good in God's sight. This too is vanity and striving after the wind. Does the unbeliever know that God is giving him the strength and the wisdom to accumulate and do all the things that he does so that he can provide for those people whom he hates? That's what God does. He's still the same God. God always provides. God's people never lack what is necessary for them to live in faithfulness. That is the God we serve. The prisoners and the passengers are spared from death. The hospitality, the extraordinary display of common grace, the religious thoughts of the natives, God versus God, and the miraculous, extraordinary display of God's power in the healings and the cures that took place. Father, thank you for giving us this passage, this word, all the examples of your good provision in your people is encouraging to us because we know that you are the same God that always provides for your people. That doesn't excuse laziness, doesn't give us a, give us a reason to be lethargic. That truth is motivating to us. It's encouraging to us it's calling us to be courageous. It's calling us to be responsible, to seek to please you by obeying Scripture. And we thank you for that. Thank you for the clarity of your word. Press upon our hearts the truth of what we have learned today. May it be transforming in our life. May you be glorified in our life and everything that we do. May we not be ashamed. Lord, don't let us be ashamed of what people think. You are an awesome God. May we have the boldness to live and to speak your truth. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.